Welcome to Time Traveling Team, the weekly podcast where we review every story of Doctor Who right from the very beginning. I'm Paddy. And I'm Trisha. This week we join the Doctor and Sarah as they visit the planet of Peladon. But are things going well for the Doctor's old friends? We'll be discussing the Doctor, the companions and the villains and give your thoughts on the story as a whole. We'd also love to hear your thoughts on this story. So in order to join the discussion, you can check us out at Time Team, that's T-I-M-E-T-E-A-M-P, on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can email us at timetravelingteamp at teamproductions.com. But first, the story recap. Part 1. In the caverns beneath the Royal Palace of Peladon, a group of miners are wheeling some equipment through one of the tunnels. They suddenly see something appear in front of them, and they believe it to be the spirit of Agador, the royal beast of Peladon. One of the workers is killed by a strange ball of light, and the others flee to safety. They flee past Eckersley, a human geologist, and Nexos, a satyr-like alien from the planet Vega, who is there as a mining expert, as they are examining a sample of ore that the miners have excavated. Eckersley stops one of the miners, whose name is Etis, who tells him about the apparition of Agador. He says that Agador killed one of the workers for blasphemy as they were preparing to use a sonic lance, which Etis refers to as alien technology. A short while later, Eckersley and Nexos join Alpha Centauri, the Galactic Federation ambassador to Peladon, in the throne room where they discuss the event with the Chancellor Ortron and the young queen Thalera. Nexos voices his opinion that there is sabotage at play with someone using the minor superstitions against them. Queen Thalera suggests holding a display to showcase the advanced mining equipment to show that there is no need to fear it. Alpha Centauri commends her on the idea as it will allow them to mine the ore, which is called Tris Silicate, faster and will help the Federation in the war which they are currently engaged in with the forces of Galaxy 5. Thalera then dismisses them and after they leave, Ortron confronts her over her decision, but she counters his statements that she is carrying out her father's wishes to make Paladin a fully-fledged member of the Federation. Ortron says that he has been working towards the same goal since he became the Chancellor, but he reminds her that the sacrifices will have to be expected whilst being members of the Federation. Later, he goes to the secret temple of Agador and asks the spirit of the royal beast to pass judgment on those that deserve it. In the caverns beneath the palace, the TARDIS materialises and the Doctor exits it with Sarah Jane, but is confused that they have not landed in the citadel of Peladon as he intended. They make their way through the tunnels and the Doctor tells Sarah Jane that they have probably landed in the cave network beneath the citadel. Unbeknownst to them, they are being observed by a guard who rushes off to inform of their appearance. Elsewhere in the tunnels, Thalera and her entourage arrive at the site where the sonic lance is being prepared and she is greeted by the chief miner, Gebek. Gebek tells her that there is still uncertainty over the use of the equipment, echoing Etis' comments about Agador, but Nexos insists that it is saboteurs from Galaxy 5 at work. Gebek relays the guard's message about the appearance of the strangers in the tunnels and Orchard orders them to be found and captured. Eckersley then begins the demonstration, which is initially successful, but another apparition appears and Nexus is killed by it when he tries to calm down the miners. Meanwhile, the Doctor and Sarah Jane continue to wander through the tunnels, and the Doctor reluctantly admits that they are lost when Sarah Jane asks why they can't go back to the TARDIS. After a while, the Doctor recognises where they are, but Sarah Jane points out the sound of someone approaching. The Doctor says it is most likely the Royal Guard, but Sarah Jane runs down a tunnel when she sees them approach with brandished weapons. The Doctor follows her down the tunnel, which she thinks is a dead end, but the Doctor uses a wall sconce to open a secret passage that leads into the Temple of Agador. The Doctor starts to tell Sarah Jane about the story of his first trip to Paladon, but he is stopped when the guards enter and capture him. They are then brought to the throne room, where Ortron accuses them of sabotage. Sarah Jane denies these charges, but she is told to be silent. The Doctor then requests to speak, and asks what happened to the King. When he is told that he died, he reveals himself as the Doctor, and mentions his friendship with the King. Ortron says that the Doctor's name is well known and would be the perfect disguise for a saboteur. However, the matter is resolved when Alpha Centauri, whose appearance shocks Sarah Jane, enters the room and vouches for the Doctor. Talera hands them into Alpha Centauri's custody, but asks that a report be sent on their reason for being on Peladon. After they leave, Ortron says that they cannot be trusted, blaming the Doctor for convincing the King to join the Federation in the first place, but Talera says that they are if they're enemies, then they will soon find out. In the tunnels, Gebek prepares to make his way to the throne room so he can petition the Queen to have the Federation representatives removed from the planet, but Essis says it won't work and instead suggests a rebellion. Gebek says that it won't come to that, but after he leaves, Essis tells the assembled miners to prepare to raid the Federation armory in the Citadel. In the corridors of the palace, Sarah Jane gives out about the dismissive way that Alpha Centauri is treating her, but the Doctor says that without Alpha Centauri's help, they would be dead. They are brought to the Federation quarters, where they are brought up to speed on the war by Alpha Centauri and Eckersley, who say that Galaxy 5 refuses to negotiate a peace. Sarah Jane then asks for the need for the Trisilicate from Peladon, and she is told that it is a vital component in all of the Federation's technology. 
Eccrecy then mentions Nexus's belief in the saboteurs, but they are interrupted by an alarm going off. Eccrecy turns on the security monitor, and they all watch as Etis and the other miners try to break into the armory, which is protected by heavy doors. Etis sends one of the miners, Preva, to find a Federation representative to open the door for them. He enters the Federation quarters as Sarah Jane expresses horror at Eckersley's indifference to the fate of the miners if they are caught. Prevett takes Eckersley hostage, but the Doctor attacks him and manages to disarm him. Alpha Centauri comments on the fact that Peladon is still a barbarous planet, but the Doctor says that if the miners are rebelling, then it would be best to see what they are rebelling about. He takes Prevett with him to the throne room along with Eckersley, leaving Alpha Centauri to look after Sarah Jane, who apologises for her reactions to their appearance. Gebek approaches the throne room, but he is stopped by Ortron, who says that the Citadel is forbidden to members of the mining caste. Gebek demands to speak to the Queen immediately, saying that it is for the good of all of Peladon, and Ortron reluctantly agrees. He makes his plea to have the Federation representatives removed from the planet, but Ortron says that he should obey the rulings of his leaders. Gebek says that there will be a rebellion as a result, but reminds a worry to Lyra that he is loyal to her. A guard enters and informs him of the attack on the armory, moments before the Doctor arrives with Preva. Ortron accuses Gebek of being in league with the rebels and orders him to be arrested. The Doctor tries to intervene, but Ortron says that they are to be executed for treason. The Doctor attacks the guards, giving the two miners a chance to escape, and Ortron orders him to be executed in their stead. The Doctor says that he did it to avoid a rebellion that could lead to civil war and begs Talira to allow him to prove that the apparitions of Agador are being used to cause unrest. Talira agrees and says that her champion will accompany him into the caverns. Ortron then secretly orders that the miners are to be hunted down and either captured or killed. The Doctor and the Champion enter the hole in the tunnel that was cut open by earlier by the Sonic Lance, and the Doctor looks around for any clues as to the source of the apparition. Suddenly, an explosion caused by Etis and one of his followers, who had earlier booby-trapped the hole, causes the roof to cave in, sealing them in the hole. Suddenly, the apparition of Agador appears and it shoots the Champion with a ball of light, vaporising him. Part 2 the apparition disappears and the Doctor tries to dig his way out of the hole. Outside, Gebek arrives and berates Etis for his actions. Etis says he did it to appease Agador, hoping that his sacrifice would be accepted. Gebek is startled when he learns it was the Doctor who was inside the hole and frantically starts to dig him out, knowing that he is their best ally in their endeavour. However, they are unable to shift the debris and Gebek says he will use the nearby sonic lance. The Doctor hears the machine powering up and stands back as it blasts a chunk of the debris out of the way. The apparition reappears and the Doctor dives through the newly made hole to escape the energy balls it fires at him. The Doctor offers to help them find out what is going on and to save Peladon. Etis is reluctant to accept his help as he believes it will only anger Agador further, but the Doctor says that whoever is behind the apparitions is trying to sow discord on the planet. Meanwhile, up in the Federation quarters, an alarm is sounded, alerting Sergei and the Alpha Centauri to the use of explosives in the tunnels. Knowing that is where the Doctor went, Sarah Jane leaves to make sure he's okay, and Alpha Centauri summons Eckersley to the quarters. Sarah Jane uses the secret entrance in the Temple of Agador to access the tunnels, but ends up getting lost. She comes across a cabin built into the rock and notices someone inside, but they don't answer her. She knocks on the door and is suddenly assaulted by a sonic device. This is noticed by Eckersley and Alpha Centauri, who are watching her on a view screen, and they rush to help her. In the tunnels, Gebek and the other miners lay out their grievances to the Doctor, telling him that only the higher castes of Peladon have benefited from joining the Federation, whilst things have gotten worse for the miners. The Doctor repeats his belief that someone is behind the apparitions, and begs the miners not to take any more action whilst he investigates things, telling them that they are outmatched by the Federation forces on the planet. Gebek agrees and brings Preva with him to take the Doctor to the throne room. However, after they leave, Etis tells the other miners to prepare for another attack on the armory, due to the fact that the Doctor accidentally revealed the doors to it are controlled from the Federation quarters. Meanwhile, Sarah Jane comes to as Alpha Centauri and Eckersley arrives, and he explains that she activated the self-defense mechanism for the cabin, which is actually the refinery control room. Sarah Jane asks who's inside it, but Eckersley says that there's no one there, and Alpha Centauri suggests that they go back to the Federation quarters. Alpha Centauri takes one last look at the cabin before they leave, and after they go, a figure appears by the window and watches them leave. In the tunnels, Preba says that there are guards ahead and tells Gebek and the Doctor to hide, whilst he leads them away. Gebek emerges after they have gone, but he is captured by another pair of guards. However, the Doctor sneaks up on them and knocks them out, allowing him and Gebek to carry on to the throne room. Unbeknownst to them, Ortron has convinced Talera that the Doctor is in league with the miners and helping them with the rebellion, and says that he must be executed. On the way back to the Federation quarters, Etis ambushes Sarah Jane and the others. 
He knocks out Eckersley and leads Sarah Jane and Alpha Centauri to the control room of the quarters, demanding that they open the doors to the armory. Alpha Centauri refuses, but Ettis threatens to kill Sarah Jane unless they open them. Reluctantly, Alpha Centauri opens the doors, but an alarm goes off, and Ettis, thinking that he has been betrayed, attacks them, but is stopped by Sarah Jane, who says that Alpha Centauri had no idea that the alarm would go off. Ettis takes Sarah Jane as a hostage and joins the other rebels who have successfully stolen the weapons from the armory. She manages to get away from him, but is captured by Ortron, who has called in the Royal Guards after the alarm was sounded, and he orders her to be taken to the temple. In the tunnels, Gebek and the Doctor come across Ettis and the rebels, who tell them of their successful raid. Gebek goes to deal with them, and the Doctor wishes him luck as he presses on to the throne room. Meanwhile, Alpha Centauri has managed to wake up Eckersley and tells him what happened. They go to investigate the armory and are informed by a guard that Sarah Jane was taken to the temple. In the temple, Sarah Jane pleads her innocence, but Ortron refuses to believe her. The Doctor arrives as Ortron outlines his theory that he and Sarah Jane came to Peladon to help the rebels overthrow the Queen. The Doctor begs him to join with Gebek to stop the rebellion, but Ortron ignores him and says that he will consult with Agador as to how they should be punished. In the throne room, Alpha Centauri tells Talera that Ortron is misinterpreting the facts, but when the Queen asks Eckerlis to confirm the ambassador's story, he says that he cannot do to his unconsciousness. However, he says that the arrival of the Doctor and Sarah Jane is very convenient. Alpha Centauri insists that the duo are innocent, but Talera says that she cannot do anything as Ortron's role as High Priest gives him power in this situation. Alpha Centauri says that there have been many changes to Peladonian law since joining the Federation, and says that this situation is no different. Talera then leads them to the temple. However, when they arrive, Ortron tells her that she is too late, as the Doctor and Sarah Jane have been dropped into the sacrificial pit to face the judgment of Agador. In the pit, the duo hear a growling sound and come face to face with Agador. Part 3 The Doctor tries to calm down Agador as the beast attacks them, and he remembers the Venusian lullaby that he used during their first encounter. He takes out the TARDIS key and spins it on its chain as he sings the Venusian lullaby, and slowly Agador falls under its hypnotic spell. Sarah Jane then asks what would happen to them, and the Doctor says that Agador has passed his judgement, and he calls up to the temple for them to be released. Talir orders Ortron to have them released immediately. Word of this is sent to the Federation quarters, where Alpha Centauri says they can go back to dealing with the miners. Eggersley suggests that Alpha Centauri requested that a detachment of Federation troops be sent to the planet to put down the rebellion. He also says that they can't risk losing control of the Trisilicate deposits. He then realises that the Sonic Lance could be used by the miners in the Rebellion, and he goes to get some guards to help him retrieve it. After he goes, Alpha Centauri goes to the communication station and sends a priority message to the Federation. In the throne room, Talir berates Ortron for his actions and tells him that he must stand by Agador's judgement. Ortron then leaves, and Talir invites the Doctor and Sarah Jane to sit down for refreshments as they go over what he found out. He reveals the feeling of the miners and suggests that she ally with Gebek to stop the Rebellion. Talira agrees to meet with him and listen to the grievances of his people so they can work towards improving them. The Doctor agrees to send word to Gebek and tell Sarah Jane to stay with Talira and talk to her about the women's liberation movement on Earth whilst he goes to speak with Alpha Centauri. Talira says that she was only queen as there were no male heirs available and she is still only a girl but Sarah Jane reminds her that she is still the queen and therefore has authority. The Doctor goes to the Federation quarters where Alpha Centauri says that they have requested military support. The Doctor says that will only make matters worse and goes to find Gebek. Before he leaves, Sarah Jane arrives and tells him about her experience at the refinery, suggesting that whoever is behind the apparitions could be hiding in the cabin there. Ortron then arrives with a guard and says he still doesn't trust the Doctor and he is to remain within the Citadel until he has confirmed his innocence. He then leaves with the guard but hides around the corner and observes the Doctor as he leaves to go meet with Gebek. Ortron and the guard follow after him but are spotted by Sarah Jane, who in turn follows them. She goes into hiding when a hidden guard apprehends the Doctor as he was about to use a secret door into the tunnels and she watches as Ortron leads him down to the dungeons. After they leave, she enters the secret tunnel and makes her way to the refinery. Meanwhile, Gebek tries to get the miners to see reason, but Etis has them whipped up into a frenzy and says they need to take control of things themselves. With no other choice, he follows them as they make their way to the Sonic Lance, where they see Eckersley working on it with a pair of guards. Sarah Jane then arrives and tells them that the Doctor also thinks the miners will attack it. Suddenly Ettis and the miners open fire, killing the guards. Eckersley uses the sonic lance to return fire, but Gebek sneaks up on them and takes him and Sarah Jane prisoner. She tells him about Talir's desire to speak to him, and Gebek says that he will go to the throne room when he can. He then allows her and Eckersley to go free, much to the disapproval of Ettis, 
but Gebic stands by his decision, and he tells Etis and the others to take the sonic lance with them. In the throne room, Alpha Centauri protests the Doctor's imprisonment, saying that he is under their protection. Ortron demands to know the Doctor's official status within the Federation, and when Alpha Centauri cannot say what it is, he uses it to try and convince Talira that he was right to do what he did. He then says they will have Sarah Jane arrested as well, but Talira orders her to remain free, and he agrees, saying that as a female she can cause no harm. Eckersley and Sarah Jane then enter the throne room and reveal the capture of the Sonic Lance. Alpha Centauri then reveals the imminent arrival of the Federation troops, a fact which shocks and horrifies Talira and Ortron. Sarah Jane then asks if they can be sent away, but Alpha Centauri says that the Federation Charter prevents them from being recalled until the crisis has been resolved. Sarah Jane suggests that they call a truce with the rebelling miners to give the impression that the issue has resolved itself. Everyone agrees to it, and Sarah Jane then goes to find the dungeon holding the Doctor. She encounters Gebic as he is making his way towards the throne room, and tells him about the capture of the Doctor. He tells her that he will help free him and sends her back to the throne room. He arrives at the dungeon and the Doctor, seeing him approach, distracts the guard with a magic trick, thereby allowing Gebic to knock him out. They lock the guard in the cell, and the Doctor, not knowing of the plan that Sarah Jane has put into place, says they need to go to the refinery to see if they can find any clues to the source of the apparitions. They hide as they see a group of miners being accompanied by guards, which confuses Gebek, but the Doctor says that they need to proceed to the refinery. They arrive at the cabin and the Doctor starts to deactivate the power source for the security system. In the Federation quarters, Alpha Centauri receives a message from the commander of the security forces, saying that they will be landing soon. Echozy then views the security monitors to see if he can locate the stone and sonic lance. They see the Doctor and Gebek at the refinery, and Alpha Centauri and Echozy think that the Doctor has betrayed them. Sarah Jane then reveals their theory that the apparitions are being created by someone in the cabin. Meanwhile, Ortron meets an assembled group of miners and tells them about the truce, saying that once the security forces have gone, then they will give, be given a forum to air their grievances. The miners agree and go back to work, but as they do so, an apparition appears and kills one of them, causing the rest to flee. Gebek hears the commotion and tells the doctor to hurry. The doctor gets the door open and is greeted by the sight of an armed ice warrior. Part 4 the Doctor and Gebek's capture is viewed by Sarah Jane, Eckersley and Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri tells Sarah Jane that they are ice warriors and that they are the security forces of the Federation, but expresses confusion that they have already arrived on the planet. They are interrupted by the arrival of the security force commander, Ice Lord Azexir, who informs them that the planet has been placed under martial law. He brings them to the throne room where the Doctor and Gebek have also been brought under guard, and he goes over the facts of the scenario at hand. He then informs everyone that his sole interest is that the trisilicate manufacturing is not stopped. He orders Gebek to send the miners back to work where they will be watched by the Royal Guard. He then threatens that if they do not work then they will be killed. Gebek and Ortron unite in their refusal to be ordered around by the Federation, but as Exir informs them that hostages from the local population have been taken and they will be killed unless his orders are followed. Meanwhile, against Etis' wishes, Preva and the other miners insist that they should attempt to rescue Gebek. They make their way up to the palace via the secret passageways. They encounter a guard who tells them that Gebek is in the throne room, and Essis leads them towards it. In the throne room, Talira says that Exexir has overstepped his authority, and Alpha Centauri also protests, but Exexir replies that he could do so under the dictates of martial law. The Doctor asks what would happen if the Peladonians defied his threats, and he replies that the Federation personnel would be brought to do the mining instead, and the plans would be placed under Federation rule. Talira, Gebek and Ortron all vow that Paladon will fight back against such oppression and Exexir says their planet will be destroyed as a result. The Doctor then reveals he goaded Exexir to reveal the extent of his brutality and the Ice Lord backpedals by saying that he wants to reach a peaceful settlement first. Suddenly, Etis and the other miners burst into the throne room but the Ice Warriors open fire, killing all of the miners except Etis, who flees back into the tunnels. Exexir then orders his second in command, Skell, to take the Doctor and Sarah Jane back to the Federation quarters and has Alpha Centauri and Eckersley go back with them. He also departs, leaving the Peladonians under guard and Ortron promises Gebek that they will get revenge for the death of the miners. In the Federation quarters, Azexir says that he intends to have the Doctor executed as a spy, but the Doctor and Sarah Jane say that he is the only chance of negotiating with Gebek and the miners. Alpha Centauri and Eckersley also say that the Doctor is their best hope and Azexir agrees to let him speak to Gebek but says that if he fails, then he will be executed along with the first batch of hostages. He then departs with Eckersley to inspect the refinery. After they have gone, the Doctor asks Sarah Jane if Skell was the person she saw in the refinery. After taking a closer look, she confirms that it was. 
Alpha Centauri is shocked by this, but the doctor says that his ex here is operating in a rogue capacity. He then leaves to go speak with Gebek, and after he leaves, Alpha Centauri tries to contact the Federation, but discovers that all outgoing signals are blocked. The doctor arrives back to the throne room and talks with the three leaders, who firmly state their intention to fight back if a single hostage is harmed. The doctor asks Gebek to convince the miners to pretend to go back to work until such a time as he can get rid of the Ice Warriors. Gebek agrees and leaves with the doctor to go address the miners. Through coded phrasing, he lets the miners know that the orders to go back to work is a ruse, and they agree to follow him. The doctor goes to inform his ex here of the miners' agreement, and the Ice Lord says that he suspended the doctor's execution whilst he remains of use, but then sends it back to the Federation quarters. The doctor joins Sarah Jane in the control room, where he slowly increases the temperature in the refinery to weaken the Ice Warriors. In the mines, Ettis finds the miners working, and one of them tells him about Gebek's speech. Ettis refuses to believe that Gebek hasn't betrayed them, and he says that he intends to use the Sonic Lance, which is currently in a cave overlooking the Citadel, to destroy the palace and everyone in it. The miner, realising that Ettis has gone mad with paranoia, says that he will tell Gebek, but Ettis stabs him and then flees the scene. Meanwhile, Azexir goes to the throne room where Talira demands to be allowed to contact the Federation, where she can lodge a formal complaint against Azexir's actions. Azexir refuses, saying that the martial law is still in effect, as he's suspicious as to how easy the miners went back to work. At that moment, Gebek, after noticing the Ice Warrior guards have started to feel the effects of the heat, gives the signal to attack, and the miners and the Royal Guards attack with them. The attack is being watched by the Doctor and Sarah Jane, who call in the Ice Warrior guarding them to show him the attack. They then sneak out whilst he is distracted and use the secret passage to get into the tunnels. The doctor says that the guard will inform his ex here about the attack, leading him to send more men into the tunnels, giving the Paladonians a chance to retake the citadel. In the course of the fighting, Gebek finds the wounded miner, who tells him about Etis' plan. The doctor and Sarah Jane arrive, and Gebek tells them about Etis. The doctor says he will go and stop him, saying that Gebek needs to stay with the miners as they will only follow him. The Doctor then leaves and Gebek gets Sarah Jane to look after the wounded miner. However, after Gebek and his men move forward, she is captured by Skell, who drags her back to the Federation quarters, where Azexir and Alpha Centauri are waiting. Sarah Jane tries to warn them about Etis and the Sonic Lance, but Azexir says that he is already aware of its location, as his ship scanned it when they arrived. He then turns on the security monitor that shows where the Sonic Lance is, and they see Etis engaging the Doctor in a sword fight. Alpha Centauri worries about what happened if Etis wins, but Azexir says that he can destroy it remotely through its self-destruct circuit. As they fight, the Doctor tries to convince Etis that all of the Peladonians are working together against the Ice Warriors, but the paranoid miner refuses to believe him. Etis eventually gets the upper hand by headbutting the Doctor, and he goes to activate the lance, which blows up. Part 5 Sarah Jane berates Azexir for having killed the Doctor as well as Etis, but the Ice Lord says that it was a necessity in order to save the Citadel. Sarah Jane defiantly says that the miners still control the tunnels, but Azexir confidently states that that can be dealt with. He instructs Eckersley to turn off the ventilation system in the tunnels, and Sarah Jane begs him not to. Eckersley sympathises with her over the loss of the Doctor, but goes to carry out Azexir's orders. Azexir then orders Skell to take Sarah Jane to the throne room, and after they go, he turns to Alpha Centauri to discuss the new administration he wants to set up on the planet. Meanwhile, in the cavern with the now destroyed Sonic Lance, the Doctor slowly comes to and then makes his way back through the tunnels to the refinery. He is found by Gebek and he tells him about the fate of Etis. Gebek tells him that they managed to get the Ice Warriors out of the tunnels, but he says the temperature is being lowered again and he expects them to attack soon. They then realise that the ventilation system has been shut off and the Doctor asks to be taken to the control room, which is in the refinery. The Doctor asks after Sarah Jane, and Gebek sadly tells him of her disappearance. In the throne room, Talira comforts Sarah Jane over the loss of the Doctor, but they are interrupted by the arrival of Alpha Centauri, who tells him about Azexir's plans to subjugate the entire planet and have them work in the mines. Sarah Jane sends the need to find a way to get a message to the Federation, but Alpha Centauri says that he can only broadcast a general SOS message. Sarah Jane says that it is their best hope, but they need to get past the guard monitoring them. Ortron says that there is a secret passageway behind the throne and is shocked when Talira says that she will go join the miners in the tunnels. He tries to forbid her, but her defied nature shames him and he agrees to the plan. Talira then pretends to be ill and Alpha Centauri goes to alert the guard, who goes to check on her. Sergin then pushes the guard and tells everyone to run, but the guard stops Talira. Ortron rescues her, but he is killed by the guard and a grief-stricken Talira goes to his body. As Exer then arrives and demands to know where Sergin and Alpha Centauri are, and she tells him that they went into the tunnels. 
Thinking that he has all his eggs in one basket, he leaves and tells the guard to keep an eye on Talera. In the tunnels, the Doctor and Gebek make their way to the cabin in the refinery and take cover as Azexior and a guard go inside. Inside, the Ice Lord and Eckersley discuss their plans to start selling Tricilicate to Galaxy 5. Unbeknownst to them, they reveal themselves as traitors as Sarah Jane and Alpha Centauri are monitoring them on the security system after they successfully sent out the SOS. The Doctor and Gebek are also paying attention to the conversation from the doorway, and they hear Eckersley say he will use the apparition of Agador to force the miners out of the tunnels so they can access the Tracilitics again. The Doctor edges closer to the door to get a better look at the control panel, and he is spotted by a delighted Sarah Jane who points out his presence to Alpha Centauri. She tells the Ambassador to keep sending out the SOS whilst she goes to join up with the Doctor. Meanwhile, Scal reports that the miners and the Royal Guards are being forced out of the tunnels by the apparition, where they are mowing down by the Ice Warrior troops. The Doctor relays this to Gebek, who tries to rush in to stop Eckersley, but the Doctor says that they need to wait to, for the right opportunity to strike. They then take cover as Azexior and Eckersley leaves. Azexior tells the guard to remain behind until Eckersley remotely reactivates the security system from the Federation quarters, as the Doctor had damaged the primary system. The Doctor and Gebek try to figure out a way to get past the guard, and they are given an opportunity by the arrival of Sarah Jane, who distracts the guard, allowing Gebek to knock him out with a rock to the head. Sarah Jane hugs the Doctor, who then goes to fix the damage done to the security system so they can use it to defend themselves when they go into the cabin. As Exeter and Eckersley arrive back to Federation quarters, where they discover Alpha Centauri sending out the SOS. Alpha Centauri tries to pass it off as an attempt to summon reinforcements for his Exeter, but he says that they will pay for their interference. Eckersley intervenes, saying the Ambassador only meant to help, and his Exeter instead takes him to the throne room, where he informs Talera that the rebellion has been put down. Alpha Centauri reveals Azexir and Eckersley's treachery, and Eckersley again stops Azexir from killing them, as the Ambassador can still be of use. Eckersley asks how they found out, and Alpha Centauri says that they saw everything on the security monitor with Sarah Jane. Azexir demands to know where she is, and Alpha Centauri reveals that she went to meet the Doctor, and Azexir sends Skell to kill them. After he goes, Alpha Centauri asks Eckersley why he and Azexir betrayed the Federation. Eckersley says that Azexir is part of a breakaway group of the Ice Warrior Society that wants to return to their warmongering ways before joining the Federation. In return for his help, Eckersley says that he was promised control of Earth as well as a percentage from the sale of the Tricilicate. In the refinery, the Doctor and the others go to the cabin after fixing the alarm, and the Doctor turns to the ventilation system back on before going to the controls of the Agador apparition. However, Skell arrives and uses his sonic weapon to start melting the door to the cabin. A pair of ice warriors join him and they cut open a large hole in the door as Sarah Jane and Gebek tell the Doctor to hurry. Part 6 The Doctor uses the control panel to send the apparition of Agador outside where it kills the two ice warriors, helping Skell, who flees back to the throne room. The Doctor tells Gebek to go back to the miners and rally them again. Gebek says that they may be reluctant as many of them have been killed, but the Doctor says that if they see the apparition of Agador is with them, then they will fight. Gebek goes to the miners and the remaining royal guards, who are reluctant to fight again, but the apparition of Agador appears before them as the Doctor and Gebek arranged. Seeing that the apparition means them no harm, the rebels follow Gebek to the throne room. Skell arrives back at the throne room and informs Zexir and Eckersley about the Doctor's control of the apparition. Eckersley says that he can get the Doctor and the others out of the cabin and leads the Ice Warriors to the Federation quarters. They access the security monitor, where they see Gebek rallying the Peladonians before switching the camera to the cabin. Eckersley speaks to them and tells him to surrender or he will activate the security system, which he says can be reversed into the cabin. He gives them a demonstration at the lowest level, and the Doctor tells Sarah Jane to go and join Gebek, as he is more resistant to the sensory attack than she is. She reluctantly leaves, and the Doctor continues to work on the apparition controls. As Exeter leaves Eckersley to deal with him, whilst he goes to prepare his men to attack the rebels. In the tunnels, the apparition clears the way for the rebels by killing any ice warriors in their way. Azexia reports this to Eckersley, who sets the security system to maximum power in an effort to stop the Doctor. Skell then informs Azexia that the rebels have nearly reached the Citadel, and he goes to prepare an ambush with the last of his men. Several of the rebels are killed before the Doctor manages to kill them with the apparition. However, he then passes out from the strain of resisting the security system. Sarah Jane arrives at the Federation quarters with a gun taken from one of the dead rebels she came across in the tunnels, and orders Eckersley to shut off the security system. He does so, but says it is too late and points at the motionless figure of the Doctor. Sarah Jane looks at the screen and Eckersley uses the distraction as a chance to disarm her. 
He then tells her to turn around, but rather than kill her, he locks her in and then flees down the hallway, killing a miner that tries to catch him. Gebek and the rebels arrive at the throne room where they see Azexir holding a sonic blaster to Thalera's head. The Ice Lord tells the rebels to throw down their weapons and goes to confront Gebek while Skell watches Thalera. One of the royal guards rushes towards Skell but is killed. However, Gebek and the miners use the distraction to attack Azexir and Gebek uses his sonic blaster to kill Skell. Azexir fights off the miners but is then killed by a royal guard. Talera then tells Alpha Centauri to contact the Federation and the ambassador rushes off towards the Federation quarters. They find Sarah Jane inside and tell them what happened, then notices that she seems to be in a depressed state. Sarah Jane says that Eckersley killed the doctor and then leaves to go down to his body. Alpha Centauri then goes to report this to Thalera, who is now alone as Gebek and the others have taken the dead bodies out of the throne room. Eckersley then appears and takes Thalera hostage after pistol whipping Alpha Centauri when they tried to call for help. Eckersley then takes Thalera with him through one of the secret passages so they can get to his spaceship. Meanwhile, Sarah Jane finds the doctor's body and begins to weep over it. He suddenly wakes up as her tears hit his face and he reveals that he went into a self-induced trance to block out the sensory attack of the security system. Sarah Jane gives out to him for making her worry, but he nonchalantly says that they should go back to the others. They arrive back at the throne room to find Gebek tended into the injured Alpha Centauri, who reveals Eckersley's kidnapping of Thalera. Gebek says it will be nearly impossible to find him in the t- maze-like tunnels, but the doctor says that he knows a way to track him down. He then leads Sarah Jane and the others to the Agador's pen and uses the royal beast like a bloodhound to track down Talera. They find Eckersley and Talera in a dead end, and Eckersley tells him to keep back or he'll kill Talera. She bites his hand to get away from him, and the doctor releases Agador to attack the treacherous engineer. He mauls Eckersley to death, but is shot several times in the scuffle, and the doctor sadly confirms his death. Later, Talera thanks the doctor for his aid and asks him to help her, but Sarah Jane says that she is a capable ruler without his help. Talera says that she will need to appoint a new chancellor, and the doctor recommends Gebek for the role. Talera says that he is a minor with no official title, and the doctor and Sarah Jane say that it is his qualities that count, not his title. Alpha Centauri then enters and says that Galaxy 5 have sued for peace due to the fact that they have no access to the Tricilicate after the failure of his Xera and Eckersley scheme. Gebek then arrives and says that they have located the TARDIS in the caves, and the Doctor and Sarah Jane say their goodbyes. After they leave, Talera speaks to Gebek about becoming Chancellor. At the TARDIS, Sarah Jane teases the Doctor about taking the position of Chancellor, saying that he could get a pension out of it. The Doctor then says it's time to take her home, and playfully pulls her into the TARDIS by her ear. End of the story. So I'm going to give my very parched mouth a rest and I'm going to let Trish talk for a while at the trivia spot. What have we got this week? Cool. So the air date for this penultimate story of season 11 was the 23rd of March, the 27th of April, 1974. The writer is Brian Hale. This is the final story from Brian. He previously wrote The Celestial Toymaker, The Smugglers, The Ice Warriors, The Seeds of Death and The Curse of Peladon. The director for this story is Lenny Main. This is story three of four for Lenny. We previously saw his work in The Curse of Peladon and The Three Doctors. And we'll see his directing skills once more in The Hand of Fear. This story had the working title Return to Peladon, which, slight spoiler for my overall, I would have preferred, personally speaking. Yeah. Um, well, I guess that might get to my overall, but Return to Peladon would have been a better title. Apparently, it was originally approached as you know a direct sequel to Curse, which is kind mm-hmm. of obvious, taking place only slightly later in King Peladon's reign. So it wasn't originally meant to be Thalera. It was meant to still be King Peladon. A mm. um, couple of interesting things, apparently, with this version of the story. Uh, Ortron and Eckersley would have been working together to turn Peladon into an independent world and reaping the profits from the demand for Tricilicate. So basically, an independent world that sells Tricilicate to anybody. Mm-hmm. Thalera would have been one of the king's advisors who had been due to marry him, but rejected him following his quote-unquote affair with Joe Grant. Right. And Sarah and Eckersley would have been romantically involved. Okay. A very different story to the one that we got. Um, I kind of prefer the one that we got over that one personally speaking i i i agree i i 
while there's some interesting things there, I prefer I prefer the fact that we've skipped a generation in Peladon's timeline. Yeah. Um. So you may have noticed that in a lot of the scenes with Thalira, there's mm-hmm. this very pretty refined woman in purple that stands around her all of the time. She's usually framed quite well, but mm-hmm. she says nothing. <laughs> Um, she later obviously presents the drink and the food when Talira is talking to Sarah Jane, the doctor. Mm. Um, that's her handmaiden, who is played by a woman called Frances Pigeon, who's the wife of Lenny Main. <laughs> <laughs> so because Nepotism. it's a non-speaking role, it was uncredited. But I, I can't help but looking back at it going, yeah, you framed her perfectly every time. Yeah. You're constantly waiting for her to say something or interrupt, and she doesn't. She just stands there looking really pretty. <laughs> it's like, oh, Lenny, you sweetheart. This is something I hadn't noticed, right? I wanted to see your thoughts on this. Apparently, Alpha Centauri had a new cape uh, to signify their new role on Peladon as the sort mm-hmm. of Federation ambassador to Peladon. I need to go back. Well, apparently, the original one was like a frilly yellow one. Yeah. And the new one is longer and greener. Yeah, I, I did notice that there was a bit more of a colour contrast. Okay, uh, I didn't, so that was good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, still, you know, poor Alpha, the the design is yeah. still weird. Although, I, what I will say is that I think, because this is the second time we've seen Alpha Centauri, y- you focus more on what the character is doing than how the character appears this time around. That's what true. I, that's like, what I mean, I there are a couple of flubs where, like, you can see yeah. the neck of the actor <laughs> underneath, and at one point yeah. his feet stick out. Yeah. Um, but overall, I mean, I thought Alpha worked fairly well the last time as well. Um, I yeah. just hadn't been paying attention to their clothes, if I'm being perfectly honest. <laughs> um. So we mentioned last week that John was having serious problems with his back. Mm-hmm. And so that continued throughout this production block. And it became so bad that Terry Walsh, who's another stuntman that works on Doctor Who, um, had to do more and more filling in for him. Mm. And this is incredibly obvious in today's world when you're watching the fight between the Doctor and Etis at the end of episode four. You can very clearly see that it's Terry's face. (laughs) It's actually, it's the second half of the fight. So the first half of the fight is a sword fight. That's John. Yeah. Then John gets the Well, it's John for the bits that are facing John. It's Terry for the bits that are facing Etis. But then like when he does uh, a hip toss to Etis, it's very clearly Terry. Yeah. Like it is like Shatner level of that's a stuntman, (laughs) you know? Yeah, like, uh, it's one of the things I always found interesting was, you know, you have Terry and you have the other stuntmen and whatever. It's like, could you not get them better wigs, first of all, Hmm. so they match better? Um, But this was one of those instances where it was very obvious that it was Terry. And apparently Lenny tried to kind of force the viewer to focus elsewhere by having John dub over some of the lines of dialogue Mm. so that even though your eyes are seeing Terry, your ears are hearing John and that that might trick your eyes into forgetting it's Terry. Well, oddly enough, it's not anything to do with the dialogue. It's, I think after the very first flip, uh, like after where you very visibly notice that it's Terry, I think it's, it's a very well done fight scene. Oh, it is. Yeah. It's actually really incredible. And it's night. It's, nice as was it's a change of pace to see the doctor get absolutely fucking battered like because after Etis headbutts him he he gets completely trashed like because Etis just makes mincemeat of him oh yeah I mean Etis uh, fucking wails on him like he lost the sword fight and he lost the, the physical fight yeah so it's one of the few times we've actually seen someone get the better of the doctor in a physical combat hmm. so actually around that scene obviously we have the destruction of the sonic lance Mm. Um, the actor who played Etis was actually blinded temporarily because Jesus. the magnesium flare that causes the explosion accidentally ignited in his face, mm. which sounds Jeez. incredibly unpleasant. Yeah, like that's that is very very dangerous. <laughs> mm. So Trisilicus is the 
unobtainium of this particular, or I suppose the easily obtainium um, mm. element of this story, it came from the back of a tube of toothpaste. Yeah, because like my like oh, I go spell check or whatever, like it seemed to recognize it. So I'm like, okay, clearly this is actu- an actual thing. It's an actual thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's in two pages. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, this is the last televised story to feature the planet of Peladon, though it does appear in some other media. And it's also the last televised story to feature the Ice Warriors prior to their return in the 2013 story Cold War. So we, you will not have to say all these S-E type names for a very long time. And I'm annoyed about that because I actually really enjoy the Ice Warriors. They're one of my favorite classic villains. And I'm gutted that I don't get to talk about them for another 160 stories. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah. It's interesting because I obviously, uh, you know, I've seen bits and pieces of, I would say, post Sarah Jane Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't realized that the Ice Warriors wouldn't be back until I was doing the research for today's episode. I was like, holy shit, we're actually not going to see them again. I didn't know that. I assumed that like the Cybermen and, and the Daleks and stuff, that they may crop up a little bit more. Um, no. But it's weird that the 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 monsters or the villains or the species or whatever that we consider to be classic. You know, we have the Sea Devils, we have the Silurians, we have the yeah. Ice Warriors. Um, we're going to have the zygons um yeah you know a couple of months from now um like we would consider those to be classic villains mm-hmm. but their time on the show was actually very limited <laughs> yeah so it's it's more say so like their impact classic villains yeah they're very impactful yeah. yeah and like i when i saw that the ice warriors were coming back in and i'm not going to give any details into the episode but you mean the sea the, devils sorry no uh the ice warriors Oh, oh, talking about Cold War. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah in, in Cold War, like so, like the fact when I saw they were coming back, I was like, "Yes, I have been so excited for this for so long." <laughs> I was the same about the Zygons. Yeah, oh, oh, of course, like when the Zygons were awesome, like, mm. and I, the fact that they weren't just a one-off as well. Well, mm. you know, or were they? Ooh. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, so on to our cast. So mm-hmm. as Gebek, we have Rex Robinson. This is the second of three stories for Rex. We previously saw him in The Three Doctors, where he played Dr. Tyler. Unrecognisable. Absolutely unfucking recognisable <laughs> here. Uh, and we'll see him again in The Hand of Fear, which I didn't think I knew who he was. And then the minute I said it out loud, I was like, no, wait, I know. T- just take off the big giant wig. And you're like, okay, cool. I know who you are now. Yeah. So just um, to give our listeners a bit of uh, context. So Peladonians from the upper class they have like a weird mane of like they have like nor- like white or blondish hair with a big red stripe right down the middle of it. Mm. The mining cast though have like a, w- a series of weird badger stripes going through black hair. Yeah, like it's, in a very afro style. Yeah. Like the the upper class it's red and white. So um and it, it the the streaks differ so like um Thalira has primarily red hair with a white streak um and i think um ortron is inverted i think he's a zillar yeah I think, um, the, I think i think the males are inverted yeah, yeah. So the, and the miners then have these big giant i don't know if they're black i thought they were brown afros with white badger stripes they just look like bullseye sweets on their heads <laughs> as alpha centauri we once again have dual uh acting here we have stuntman Stuart fell continuing to do the physical body work of alpha centauri and the voice is once again provided by isan churchman and we will hear isan's voice again next week in planet of the spiders mm. as thalira we have nina thomas this is nina's only doctor who acting credit her non-who credits include crown court the prince and the pauper the sweeney just william the History of Mr. Polly, Brookside, and Doctors. As Ortron, we have Frank Gatliff. Again, only Doctor Who acting credit for Frank. His non-Who credits include The Avengers, Blake Seven, Minder, Harkett Barker, His Lordship Entertains, and CAB. Frank passed away in 1990. You guys something? Yeah, I was just like, one thing that I've noticed is like the, the, the further we go into the show... The less and less we see some of our 
you know, former bingos, like we don't see Zed cars or Dixon of Doc Green or Adam Adam. And a, a lot of them are still in there. It's just they're they're further in the past from when the people gotcha. came to. Do yeah, you know what I mean? Gotcha. So, yeah. Um, a lot of these people have very long lists, and I'm not going to read them all. Yeah. <laughs> um. As Etis, we have Ralph Watson. This is the third story for Ralph. We previously saw him or heard him in The Underwater Menace and also in The Web of Fear, where he was Captain Knight. That's who he was. Yeah. He, he, looked, he looked familiar. We'll see him again in the horror of Fang Rock. His non hit credits include When the Boat Comes In, Battle of the Sexes, Dave Allen at Large, Zed Cars, since you mentioned it, <laughs> <laughs> The Bill, and Second Verdict. Ralph passed away in June of 2021. Oh. As Eckersley, we have Donald Gee. This is the second and final appearance on Doctor Who for Donald. We previously saw him in The Space Pirates, which I have forgotten. His non who credits include also Zed Cars. Oh, <laughs> this is only Jesus because you mentioned yeah, it. <laughs> only because I mentioned it, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Coronation Street, Born and Bred, and On the Move. Donald passed away in January of 2022. Oh. Isaac Sear is played by Alan Bennion. This is the final Doctor Who appearance for Alan, who previously saw him as Slar in The Seeds of Death and as Islier in The Curse of Paladon. Yeah, he's like, I only play nobility. Ice Lord nobility. Yeah, it's like, no more Ice Warriors, no more Alan. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, we can't do it without Alan. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah. Alan retired. Shit. Okay, we can't do yeah. Ice Warriors anymore. <laughs> That's it. Pack it in. Pack it in. <laughs> Hales, you've got to find somebody else to write about. <laughs> So, thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Uh, now we are going to our character discussion. So, as always, we have the Doctor, the Companions, the prominent characters, and the villains. So, I this week, in terms of the Doctor, there is the Doctor, <laughs> the Companions. I put down Sarah Jane Gebbick and Alpha Centauri. Mm-hmm. The prominent characters are Ortron, Talera, and Etis. So, mm-hmm. the remaining the Peladonians. And then the villains are Azexia and Eckersley. I put Alpha Centauri in a prominent character role. Though we can kind of see why you had them as a companion. I don't know why I didn't put them as a companion. I think it is possibly by virtue of the fact that one or two times, thi- one or two times, <laughs> one or two times, Alpha Centauri prob- is a bit of a doubting Thomas. Probably. That could be why. Yeah. I think as well, it takes a long time so obviously we have the initial we'll get to what we're talking about obviously we'll, we'll talk yeah. about them um, yeah. we have the doctor first though yeah what we can do is we can leave Alpha Centauri last in terms of the companion speak and yeah. to maybe lead into prominent characters so uh, do you want to go first in the doctor or will I go on first you can go first I've gone first the last few times cool um, so I think this is a very good showing from the doctor um, I did enjoy that like, he had learned because I, I went back and I listened to our Curse of Paladin uh, episode uh yesterday after i finished monster uh just to kind of go over some you know bits of thought processes and stuff like that and it was like it's great to see him over you know like, learn from his previous experience with ice warriors like he we were on about like that sort of slight racism he had mm-hmm. against them and like, he's learned from it and you know he's at when he first meets his ex here he's commending him on his deductive abilities it's a shame that it comes back and bites him in the ass. Like, because, like, oh, I know these are bad guys this time around. It's also a bit misplaced because he obviously knew that Slar and the other one were. Obviously, he knew that at least two Ice Warriors were behind what was happening. Yeah. But maybe he just trusted Azexir to not be one of the two that yeah. were behind it. Maybe he heard the voice and was like, You sound awfully familiar. <laughs> Do you know his Lear? <laughs> I think I knew your dad. Yeah. <laughs> um. I loved it. Like, I really enjoy his uh, screen time with Gebek. Mm, me too. Like, I, I think they work really, really well together. And um, it's nice to see him constantly champion Gebek's cause, you know? Mm. In the sense of, he knows that, like, of, you know, the, the miners are, like, rebelling and stuff like that. But he still trusts in Gebek's ability to get them around. Mm. So it's nice that he doesn't doubt him at any stage. Yeah. I liked his relationship with Sarah Jane for the most part, though. And the reason I say for the most part is because of 
speaking from personal experience, it's never nice to make your friends think that you're hurt and then kind of mock them over their feelings. Yeah, I, I, this is this is one of the things that I had on my list. Is how many times gonna make her believe you're dead? <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> and then sort of take the piss out of her for feeling bad for you. And I love the way Liz plays this. Yeah, when he's like, "No, I'm fine," and she's like, oh, "Okay, like, <laughs> what the hell am I meant to do with that?" You are such an asshole. <laughs> um, obviously, the story is more doc. Uh, this is more action doctor than anything else. Mm. Because I think while the previous Paladin uh, adventure had a lot of like the who done it investigation mystery style to it, here it's like okay, the who done it is interesting, but I think what's overriding that is like the civil unrest that it's that's being caused by these strange apparitions. Mm. So my whole thing was like it wasn't to find out who was behind it; it was like can he actually intervene and keep the two sides neutral until he finds the answer um so yeah like i think it was just more action related doctor this time around and one question i'd like to ask you though right Mm. is do you think the doctor feels guilty for agador's death i think he does because he tells agador to attack eckersley yeah i mean agador has always sort of been his own little furry self yeah. Um, and while the people of Paladon worship him, hmm. and they obviously occasionally sacrifice people to him, mm-hmm. Agador is his own being, do you yeah. know, and he's not a pet. No. Um, while the Doctor sometimes kind of treats him as such, um, I think that's more just a sort of, he, he sort of has a little bit of a who's a good boy yeah. home with him on occasion. Um, I, I think he does feel bad do you know like i think he never i don't think he anticipated that eckersley would shoot agador and that if he did that it would actually kill agador on you know dead on like you know um so i think he does feel guilty about that i think you know being the doctor he probably weighs it up in his mind Mm. and is like you know they saved thalira eckersley didn't get away you know, kind of a noble sacrifice type thing. Yeah. But I'm sure he I, still feels bad about it. I think it's like, what, another kind of shame to it is the fact that, or like another comp- component to that is like, Agador is the last of his species. Yeah. Yeah, so, I don't know, it, it is, it is sad, like, it is sad. Mm. Your thoughts, you, or do you have any other different thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think it's a very good showing for the Doctor here. Um, I do think we get to see all the best parts of the Doctor on display here. Um, mm. Including his hypnotism skills, we get the return <laughs> of the Venusian lullaby, which I love. Yes, um, it is something that like does not get used enough in Doctor Who because it's fantastic, and I absolutely adore it. We do also get a lot, like you're saying that it's a lot of action Doctor, and I'd agree. There is also a lot of science Doctor, though. Um, you know, in the whole thing to do with the refinery and getting into mm. the refinery and resetting the alarm and stuff like that, we do get to see the sciencey part of him still on show there uh, i think it's my virtue the fact that like we've had three fairly good outings of science doctor prior mm. to this like, like in terms of like medieval science doctor dinosaur science doctor mm. weird city science doctor. i think the difference is that like in this one he's not building anything yeah um I, I... you know so it's slightly different but yeah. um we do still get to see that on display i love the way he is with Thalira. Um, yeah. that he doesn't undermine her in the mm. same way that the others do. And we'll talk about Thalira later on, but um, it sort of reminds me a little bit of Planet of the Daleks, where Re- we had that female member oh, of the crew. Re- Rebek. Yeah, Rebek. And the Doctor just sort of directed Joe to her. It's mm. if he recognizes that he's not the best person to support her. Yeah. But that Joe would, and he does the same thing here, where he's like, you know, he kind of, it, he doesn't really stand up for Sarah Jane as much as I would maybe like at the beginning. Mm. Um, he sort of just accepts it as cultural differences and moves on, whereas Sarah is clearly being very indignant. But the Doctor also realizes, okay, this is where Sarah can really shine. You know, Sarah 
talk to her, will you please? Hmm. And give her some of the viv that you have. Yeah. Um, I was going to use a different word, but that would have come across wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I like that because, like, not only is it, you know, it could come across as like, oh, he just left the girls to talk, but I think it was a very deliberate choice on his part. Hmm. Do you know? It was his yeah. way of saying, like, he's, like, Delira doesn't need to learn from men how to do her job. No. She needs to see that just because she's a woman doesn't mean that she has to be dictated to all the time. Yeah. Um, and I think that was good. I think it was a good way of doing it. I think the relationship with Sarah develops really well. I'm going to talk about that a bit more when we get to Sarah Jane. The only downside, like you called it out, I think it's very, it's very Doctor-esque, but it's also very unfair to belittle your friend's feelings when they're literally stood over what they think is your corpse hmm. and crying for you. Um, yeah. We've mentioned that like they don't know each other well, they know each other a better now. Do you know? Like, this is their fourth outing together. We don't know what the time jump was between the end of last episode and the start of this episode. We don't have a direct run through that we had uh, in the previous stories. Mm. But they're clearly getting to know each other better. And it's like, dude, have a heart. Like, do you know, know what really went? Do you know what really went through my head here? Right, just random, right? Yeah. I would have loved. Like, I wonder what this story would have been like if it was the first Doctor and Sarah Jane. I think if it was the first Doctor and Sarah, it kind of depends on what part of the first Doctor's um, growth period he was in. I think uh, maybe post Vicky or yeah, post Vicky. I think post Vicky, how would post Vicky Hartnell Doctor react to Sarah Jane? I think he would have been very caring with her. I yeah. think he would have like sat her down and explained and comforted her and been like, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Look, look at me. I'm fine. You know, yeah. uh, come, you know come dry on, your come. tears. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, you know, that type of thing. Whereas the doctor's just like, you thought I was dead. Ha, idiot. Um, <laughs> it's like, what the hell? Uh, he doesn't obviously call her an idiot, but that's the assumption that you get. It's like, how the hell is she meant to know you can shut down your body to yeah. make it whatever? Like, she doesn't know that. And she already thought that he died, what, twice already in the story or once already in the story? Yeah, this would be the second time. Because the first time she thought he, uh, he went with the sonic lance. No, no, this is the third time. She thought he died in a cave-in as well. Um, or that he was at least seriously injured in a cave-in. Do you know? It was like, this is the third time in one story, dude. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit much. Oh. Um, but overall, I think it's a very good showing from him here. I love the way he is everyone likes it. I love the way he stands up for the miners. I love the way he does that in a respectful way to both sides. Yeah. And I love the way he sort of, he's willing to hand over control where needed, do you know? Mm -hmm. um, like, we'll get to this in a minute about, like, Sarah Jane, but, like, he wasn't the one who came up with the idea of how to get the, the how to get Azixir's forces to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and while that plan didn't work the way they would have wanted it to, like, he wasn't the one trying to come up with a plan. He was willing to let other people do what, what they do best. Um, yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, no, I think it was a good outing from him overall. Cool. So I suppose moving on to Sarah Jane now. Yeah, I really like Sarah Jane the story. I always remember her in this as uh, this is her. There's nothing only about being a girl story. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which is one of the common like clips that gets used for Sarah Jane as a character. But there's actually so much more to it than that. You know, yes, she's still held hostage on several occasions. Uh, but she also drives the plot in her own way. She drives the plot significantly, I think. Yeah, like, I say in her own way because her ideas don't actually work as well as she would like them to. Hmm. Or as well as we would like them to. But, like, it is her idea to make the Federation soldiers go away. And she gets everyone to buy into it. I, I think this is like the this is like the role-playing uh, axiom for, you know, like, no plan, so it's contact with the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like it was her idea to do that. Like she's the one who comes up with the idea for getting them all out of the throne room and mm. past the guard. Now, unfortunately, she made a very interesting choice to throw the ice warrior over Thalira as mm. opposed to maybe like in the other direction from her. Um and so obviously Thalira got stuck and then blah 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 blah. 
Um, but like she is still constantly active and constantly trying to do something mm-hmm. um, and not taking very kindly to being left behind when that happens. Um, so I think there's actually much more to her in the story than I maybe originally remembered there being. Mm-hmm. Um, her conversations with Thalira are actually really good because, again, you sort of remember it as that there's nothing only about being a girl, Your Majesty. You sort of remember that line, but she's actually very patient with her. And, you know, she doesn't yell at her or be like, you know, what the hell are you doing? Like, there's none of that. It's all sort of like, okay, let's <laughs> women's lib from the start. Okay, here we go. Um, And she's also very good to Gebek and the others. You know, like she doesn't treat them badly. The only person she has a bad reaction to is Alpha Centauri. Yeah, but she... She, but that's actually one of the things that I have is that you know she apologizes to Alpha Centauri. Yeah, she owns that. Like she owns that it's her just being nervy. Like do you know what I mean? And yeah. again, if you randomly, like the only other aliens that she has seen are Daleks, and she didn't see inside the casing. Well, she saw the Exelons. Oh yeah. Oh no, because she had Exelons and Centaurs. What am I doing? I'm giving her way too much credit. But <laughs> yeah. they were like the Exelons and the Centaur and Lynx were humanoid <laughs> yeah there was there was something there was something similar and relatable alpha centauri is a giant eyeball yep in a cloak mm-hmm. um with like six arms. arms um yeah. it's, it's a bit it's a bit to get used to i like that she owns it you know which is great like overall i think this is a great outing for her mm-hmm. and i actually liked her a lot more in the story than i remembered liking her in the story so it was good how about you go cool. Um, so yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I think this is another strong off-world story for her, you know. Mm. Um, now I'll admit that I can see why some people would have a negative view of some classic companions, due to like you know the times you know she cries or she it seems very shocked or stressed out over like the doctor not being around. But each of those times, if you just take them out of context, like that's your picture but when you watch everything within context it's all understandable mm. she's gotten very close to the doctor as of late their friendship as you can see has become very very close so obviously when she thinks that he's dead it's not as if a stranger has died it's as if, as if like a friend has died um her reactions to seeing strange and unusual things it's no fucking different than anyone else like you can no matter how many wonders you see each new wonder will shock and awe you type mm. thing you know you're not immune to a new fantastic uh, sensation um but for again like i agree with you like we get to see her ingenuity coming up with the plans we get to see her bravery by effectively going into a tunnel system with no map and no guide multiple times yeah you know that's a fucking you know a good way to find like a lost brazilian soccer team you know <laughs> um like we also like her determination you know in the sense of like she wants to carry out these plans and her compassion, because again, she reaches out to Alpha Centauri and apologizes, and I think that means a lot to Alpha Centauri. I, yeah. I get that. I get that impression that it means an awful lot to them. Because one thing that I did notice is that in the previous story, uh, Alpha Centauri is constantly referred to as a them or a they because they're hermaphrodital species. They're referred to as an it. Or is, we, yeah, we talked about this in the yeah, previous yeah, story. The doctor says it's an it. it. It's an it. Yeah. And here it's a he, which is... Yeah, he, yeah. No, see, obviously there was the greeting of the Alpha Centauri, my dear fella, which is what, you know, that's a doctor-esque mm. greeting. But here, like, they seem to have kind of shifted onto the, the male side of the equation. Mm. Uh, now, I don't know whether that was, you know, Brian forgetting what he had written about Alpha Centauri. I don't know. So I just, why I constantly refer to them as either Alpha Centauri or them, they. Um... But I think like the compassion and the outreach probably means a lot to Alpha Centauri because they are the only one of their species on this planet mm. due to their role as ambassador. Like there's no delegation. Yeah. And if there was if there was to be, it would be from the Federation and it would be made up of multiple different species. Mm. So um I think that little bit of, you know, kindness. And I, I think they work really well together. Me too. Their like partnership is great. Mm. And like it kind of it kind of mirrors in a sense to me the Doctor and Gebek's relationship. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, but yeah, so 
like what do you think of my statement there about you know you how you could take a negative view of classic companions based on sarah in this one i think so and this is something that liz Layden herself spoke about in the past i think i've mentioned it before um liz never shied away from the fact that sarah jane screamed a lot or cried a lot or was very reactionary and her comment was, if you encountered half the shit Sarah Jane did, you'd react the exact same way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I think is very true. And I think, to your point, I think taken out of context, this story is very weepy, very damsel in distress, but then also being like, oh yeah, women's lib or whatever, which I'm sure is very irritating um, mm. on their own. But if you watch the story the way it's intended, you mm. know, whether you do it an episode a week or an episode a day or six episodes all in one go, you see that like all of her reactions are very true to what's happening around her. Do you know, she is still new to all of this. And, you know, yeah, she's met, you know, bipedal uh, humanoid aliens before. Alpha Centauri is a giant walking eyeball. Um, yeah. It's a bit different. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, I think, you know, she's very, you know, this to me is sort of, it's almost like a quintessential Sarah Jane in many ways. Do you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. She has her low points. She has her weeping moments, but she also pulls herself up by her, by her bootstraps. Yeah. And it's like, I'm going after him. Fuck it. I don't know where I'm going. Fuck it. I'll go anyway. I also love how like at the end of the story, like she takes the piss out of him a lot, mm. which I love. Their whole walk back to the TARDIS yeah where she's like oh you know state job gonna have a pension i don't want to get in the way of your career do you know <laughs> yeah. i love it it's just hilariously funny because it's very much who she is and like one of the things that i didn't mention is we still see sarah jane the investigator here mm. um yeah. not quite as much as joe she wasn't cl- climbing in and out of windows and whatever um, but we still see Sarah Jane doing a lot of deductive reasoning, figuring things out, sort of being like, you know, like oh, she's the one who figured out it was the refinery that mm. someone was like, she figured, she's the one who figured that out. So I think if you look at certain scenes in isolation, yeah, she can come across as probably incredibly annoying, but you have to watch the story in context and watch those yeah. scenes in context and be like, she is a well-rounded character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. And anyone who thinks otherwise, come fight me, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so, before anyone gets a black eye, how about we move on to Gebek? <laughs> I've always liked Gebek. Yeah. Gebek is one of those characters where, like, there's obviously so many stories in Doctor Who that you've seen, and there's a lot of, like, story based companions that you kind of forget about, do you know, mm. until you watch it again. You go, oh, yeah, I really liked him. Gebek is a character I never forget. I've always mm. really liked him. Mm-hmm. he's a very strong leader he's smart he's well-intentioned he's honest he truly believes in what's best for his men and for peladon yeah. he's also both the actor who plays him and gebek the character are also very good actors mm. um the performance of of gebek is fantastic and when mm-hmm. Gebek is there being like, you remember how we cooperated with Ortron to do this? And you remember how we cooperated to do that? Come on, you fuckers, get with the program yeah. what I'm trying <laughs> to present. He's very good in that way. And he clearly has great respect for Thalira. Yeah, that's the one thing is like, one thing that never comes into question or is changes is his unwavering loyalty to her. Yeah. Like wh- whenever it's a case of like you know the miners are rebelling or where it's like or when Ortron tries to you know twist the scenario, it's like I am loyal to you. I'm not. I'm yeah. not just loyal. Like, and it's not even a case of I'm loyal to the throne. Yeah, it, he may, it comes across like as in like he's his personal loyalty is to Thalira more so than the institution of the monarchy. Yeah, I kind of get that sense as well. And he's not the only one. There's a couple of a couple of miners who would be in a very similar boat. Mm-hmm. Um, the poor fellow who gets stabbed by Etis. Yeah, when he finds out that Etis has the lance aimed at the citadel, mm-hmm. he doesn't care about the aliens in the citadel. He doesn't care about the nobility in the citadel. He cares about Thalira. Yeah, he's like, but Queen Thalira is in the citadel. You can't, you can't do that. 
Do you know, like they don't want to get rid of her. She's not their problem. And they hold great respect for her. I have a point about Talir and I just I, I I can make I think I can make it in terms of Gebek as well, is that I think there's a there's an association there because one mm-hmm. thing that's been pointed out is that women are second class citizens on Peladon, much like the mining mm-hmm. caste or the labor castes. And just be and as has been kind of pointed out throughout the story, is even though she's queen, she really doesn't have a whole lot of power. Yeah. Even though, like by right, she should have it. So I think there's that whole she, she is one of us type thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and like you see it from the start that, like, you know, jumping to Thalira for a small second, Thalira also holds Gebek in great respect. Mm. She really respects him for who he is and what he does, and yeah, she's a little bit blinded by their cultural system and stuff like that, but the respect there goes both ways yeah do you know between the two of them and you sort of get the sense of like you know Thalira says that her father died when she was very young Mm -hmm. and Gevik is clearly an elder amongst the miners like he's older than the others and whatever so you kind of again get the sense that like he watched her grow up Mm. you know from afar and from a different level yes but he did watch her grow up and come into her own and he's the head miner, so while he may not go to the Citadel often, um, there would likely have been contact between the two of them. Hmm. Um, and I just think it's very sweet. I think the way he, the way he's so respectful of her, I think is very is very very sweet. It's quite adorable. Yeah, no, I I think he's like he's definitely he's one of those characters like. If you go back to I saw fuck it like Sir William de Preu or fucking kind of like Hobson on you know on Moonbase, mm. like if you're like, you you're kind of going like you know, you must pick champions from the previous adventures and it's like cool I'll take him 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 and him. you know that that type of thing you know oh oh, oh sorry and Astrid and Astrid yeah from... Astrid like if you can comp- you could even in a slightly different way compare him a little bit to uh colonel lethbert stewart yeah actually yeah no do you know um very much in there with his men getting things done and in a similar way of you know obviously we loved you know seeing colonel lethbert stewart become the brigadier and obviously we love the brig i am kind of sad we don't get to go back to paladon and see how gebek grew and thrived in his new role yeah, because I kind of want to see how that turned out. I think he would be very good for it. I actually it, that actually kind of raises a point there, and I have it for my overall. So I'm just catalog this uh, the point for the overall side mm. of things. Um, Alpha Centauri. Yeah, so I do like Alpha Centauri more in this story than in the previous story. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's a huge improvement in Alpha this time around. Yeah, um, while he they are misled by Eckersley several mm-hmm. times. Their intentions are always good. There's a, there's an air of Jar Jar in, you know, Revenge of the Sit, you know, being being guided towards giving the emergency powers to fucking Palpatine type thing, you know? Yeah, and but it's all because like Alpha Centauri describes himself that like their species, they come from a peace loving planet. Yeah, the idea of a betrayal like Eckersley's is not something that Alpha would ever really consider as a possibility. Mm-hmm. Do you know? Like, it seems totally foreign to them that, particularly someone in the Federation, could behave with that. Now, I'll be honest. Alpha does still have a little bit racist, just a smidgen, uh, and yeah. elitist. But you know, it's only been thirty years. Give the poor fellow some time. But overall, I do like Alpha more here. They're more determined to take action. And they're not just a slave to the Federation that you maybe think they would be. Do you know? Yeah. Alpha in Curse of Peladon. Oh, it's very by the book. Very by the book. Would have followed um, Azexir, no problem. Wouldn't have gotten involved wouldn't have been questioning thing and calling for more backup. They would have just deferred to Azixir because that's what the protocol dictates. Mm. Um, whereas here, they're kind of using their own 
um initiative initiative yeah uh in a big way and you know maybe part of that is working with sarah maybe part of it is just how alpha has grown in general um but i do like them more in this one than mm-hmm. i did in the other one how yeah. about you um oh i know i completely agree like this time around alpha centauri is I can't, I can't think of a character to, at the moment, to equate it to in terms of, like, having learned from their previous fucking experiences, you know? Mm. But, um, they, no, there's just something so much better about them. Like, no, while there is that little smidge of racism, I don't think it's as, it's as harsh as it was. No. Because I think... What it's in reference to the fact that the miners like rebel. It's like you know, the like, doctor. This is still a kind of a barbar, a barbaric planet. Like they haven't come on as much as we'd hope. Whereas like it seemed like in curse every single thing levied at Paladonians by Alpha Centauri was in relation to their primitiveness or their barbarism or whatever. Yeah. Like so, there, there. No, there's an element of I suppose of like you know fucking colonialism there. Mm. You know, but uh, the one thing that really stands out to me is just Alpha Centauri seems much braver yeah in this one I, like they're more driven themselves like to suggest things or to take action which is absolutely great and it's what you want to see when you come back and you revisit characters mm. um oh actually uh, sorry I, th- I suppose it's almost like uh, Professor Travers in a way yeah the, the growth that Travers had between Abominable Snowman and Web of Fear mm. you know? one thing I'll say about Alpha is Alpha has a very selective memory they remember the doctor as being this great person. Yeah. Don't ask about Joe. Maybe it's yeah. a touchy subject in the Peladon uh possibly royal royal uh chambers. Um doesn't seem to remember that the doctor got involved in that story under false pretenses, pretending <laughs> yeah. to be the ambassador from Earth. Yeah. And then the actual ambassador turned up at the end. Yeah, like I would have liked to have heard like a trailing off conversation as they're going down a hallway, you know, something like that. Yeah, but uh, uh, they, they have a very selective memory, does our Alpha. Yeah. <laughs> I think you may have saw a thing of like you know where like the Doctor proved to be like a vital, like a friend in an hour of need. Mm. Here he is again. I don't see the reason why he would be anything different, you know. Yeah, I I just find it interesting because Thalira clearly makes mention of the fact that like the Doctor disappeared fairly fucking lively the last time. Yeah. Uh, and Delira mentions it you know, so it's interesting yeah. that Alpha doesn't particularly when like the when Alpha is asked for the doctor's papers and stuff yeah and it's like yeah you do remember that like he was <laughs> pretending to be somebody else <laughs> and like what happened to Princess Josephine like <laughs> she also wasn't a real person <laughs> but uh it's just I'm just really happy that there wasn't so much of a sort you know like you know Centauri type moment here you know yeah it was it was great Oh, that was so annoying <laughs> last yeah. time around. <laughs> but uh, to echo something we previously said, character development, you love to see it. Yeah, very much. So, no, would you have, so would you put Alpha Centauri into companion status or would you leave him as, or them as prominent character? The more I'm thinking about it, I think, yeah, I think in the way that Gebek is the Doctor's companion, Alpha is kind of Sarah Jane's companion. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think, I think we were right in that call. Cool, perfect. I think it's so, that's okay from the Doctor's perspective. Yeah. And the Doctor and Alpha don't really have that much to do with each other in the story, so... No, I think it's more so, yeah, the Sarah and Alpha hour. Mm. Uh, so, we'll move into the pr- prominent character section proper, I suppose. <laughs> so, we have Ortron, Talira, and Etis. So, what order would you like to do them in? Uh, let's do them in that order, why don't we? Ortron is perhaps one of the most irritating characters in the story. Yeah willfully taking anything you say and interpret it in whatever way suits his needs. Mm. They held me captive, which forced Alpha to flick the switch. So because of you, Alpha flicked the switch. But well yeah, I suppose if you So you admit your guilt that you collaborated with them to make Alpha flip the switch. It's like <laughs> dude, like you're grasping at like paper thin straws here. <laughs> it's like you're getting one plus one equals twenty seven. Like there's there's a big gap there between um what is reality and what you're doing. Yeah. In fairness though, and this is an interesting thing about Ortron. Mm-hmm. Ortron 
in this story embodies two characters from the previous story. Mm-hmm. So in Curse of Platon, we had a high priest and a chancellor. Mm-hmm. Here, Ortron is both. Yeah. Which if you've ever played Battlestar Galactica the board game, you know that's dangerous. You don't have them being both. No, absolutely not. Um, it's very dangerous. But what I find interesting here is that Ortron, I don't think he's trying to sort of undermine Thalira. No. Not willfully. It's, she's a girl. And it's his yeah. job to help her. And he just over-indexes on that by a lot. Yeah, like, it, there's no, I don't think it's a, a matter of, like, he's the regent here. I think mm. it's, she's a female. Yeah, but what I was, was going to say, like, is with that, like, you know, he is very dedicated to Peladon as a planet. Mm. Um, and you can see that in the way that he stands up to Azixir. Yeah. He also has very sweet moments. He has a very sweet moment with Sarah. When Sarah mm-hmm. thinks the Doctor is dead, mm-hmm. Ortron is very supportive of her. And remember, He's been calling her, like, he's been, like, just shy of calling her a witch this entire time. Yeah. <laughs> but he is very supportive of her and does his best to comfort her, mm-hmm. which is very, very sweet. And he's also so supportive and defendant of Thalira's role. Yeah. Like, he thinks it's his place to advise her. And like I said, he over-indexes on that a lot. And he takes along a lot of, a lot of, a lot of responsibility that he shouldn't. Mm-hmm. But Thalira is the queen. Yeah. That is not negotiable. At all. Do you know? Um, yeah. What she has the power to do is up for debate. But <laughs> her being the queen of Peladon is not negotiable. Um, and I love that, mm. you know, even though he was an asshole for yeah. so much of the story, his dedication and his supportive nature is still there under the covers. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um there's an air, and just because I was kind of watching some Lord of the Rings stuff earlier on, there's an air of Boromir to him, if you think about it. Yeah. Because like, like unlike Hepesh, in the who was the the high priest in the last one, mm. he's a he's a character of two halves. Mm. So in the first half, like like we have like the fucking prick who's like who's turning statements and evidence to his own ends, you know. Mm. But in the second half, like. While it is, it's nice to see him stand up to his ex here, you know. Uh, but what I think is even a more powerful moment than that is like when he says to Gebek, We will be revenged. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's like whatever our enmities between ourselves, our people come first, mm. you know? And like, it was great. Like, it was nice to see that. Um, and again, like, it's, yeah, no, I agree. Like, you know, there's an awful lot of genuine caring there for Thalira. And, I think, and he does treat her more like a girl than his sovereign, mm. um, which is a shame. But I, I don't think there's like a, there's no power hunger. I, I never mm. get that. I never get that impression from him. Unlike Hepesh, which was like, I'm ruling as regent and I get to pass stuff, you know? Yeah, I think with Orton, it's a lot of, I'll do this so she doesn't have to. Yeah. And he's just sort of been doing that for so long mm. that he doesn't realize he should have handed over the reins on a lot of those things a long time ago. And, but like, and it's again, like, it's great to see, even though he is like, a, he is a, propon- a proponent for federation membership, mm. Peladon still comes first. Yeah. And I think, for me anyway, I think there's a, there's an element of redemption in his death. Like, he risks his life to save Talera so that she can go lead their people to mm. freedom. Oh, very much so. Like, his death yeah. is actually. This is going to sound a little bit harsh, but it's almost as sad for me as Agador's. I will never forgive them for killing off Agador, just saying that yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. um, but the only reason why I say it's almost as bad is because Agador wasn't an asshole for the first half yeah. of the story. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but, I, I, but I think that comes like with like the Boromir side of things, like the noble sacrifice at the end to, to like try and right the wrongs that you've committed. Yeah. Um, I think he sort of I think as soon as Azixir was like, we'll start killing your people. Mm-hmm. I think he sort of realized, do you know what? I was making a mountain out of a fucking molehill mm-hmm. with the miners. Yeah. Okay. The, this, this is different. Like, yeah, I, I was, I was playing politics 
you know, like a, someone in a sandbox. Yeah. Um, we need to have the united front. I need to show where my loyalties lie, and they lie with the people of Paladon. They lie with Thalera. Yeah, and like it, it actually that that statement, like you know, we will be revenged. It's so. I, I for, for, again, I, I don't know whether you picked up on it, but for me, it's so genuine and heartfelt that when he talks to the miners, saying, "Look, if we do this together, you will have a forum for you to speak about your grievances." That actually comes across as genuine and not just an appeasement. To yeah, me, but, anyway, it felt genuine. Yeah, but didn't that come when? Well, I suppose yeah. I mean, like that's he's because he says that to them before he says we'll be revenged. Right, because that's when he's trying to convince them to play along. Yeah. Um, but you kind of get the sense that you know that's the beginning of it because he's like, "Shit, they're going to come here and take over." Yeah, you're right. Sorry, like I got my timelines confused. But I, th- but I think it it feeds nicely into it though. I, th- I think it sort mm. of dovetails quite nicely back around to that because you can sort of says like when they say like, "Oh, you know, the Federation is coming." <laughs> um. <laughs> And you know, when he realizes that Sarah wants the Federation to go away, um, to let them solve their own problems, you know, he sort of realizes, shit, you know, this has gotten out of control. Hmm. Let you know, I need to sort out Peladon comes first. Do you yeah. know? And I need to get this sorted, you know, let's get this sorted and I will listen to them. And I think I think I think that's why it comes off so genuine. Mm-hmm. And then it obviously it dovetails into the we will be revenged. Uh, Thalira? Thalira is more like her father than I think she knows. Mm. In the sense that, unfortunately, she is... And this is probably because the way she was raised. She's willing to let others rule for her. Yeah. And she doesn't question... She doesn't question that as much as she should. But her father had the same problem. Hmm. however it is very good to see her standing up to Ortron which she does way more than her father did to his high priest um, yeah like she stands up to like as soon as she sort of talks it over with Alpha and Alpha explains what happens she's like you know oh but Ortron has full control in the temple which is why he shouldn't have both positions but how's ever yeah. but then she's like no like you know Alpha's like you're, you're the queen fucking act like us do you know and she sort of gets her act together and goes down and she's like no what have you done you are overstepping your bounds and i love the fact that she calls him on it Mm -hmm. and says you are overstepping again like quit it (laughs) (laughs) quit it old man this is ridiculous i do think it's great to see like she clearly comes into her own throughout the story i think it's done very well um because mm. it's not like an immediate turnaround it's this gradual through her interactions with sarah through her conversations with alpha through the things that she often just is witness to as opposed to a participant in mm-hmm. um she does grow and develop um and while she may not have the best leadership skills as of yet she does have an incredibly strong will mm. um and like the way she stands up to azixir do you know and yeah, like, the way she's sort of like, this is my, you sort of like, she doesn't say it because it's like a sense of like, I dare you shoot me and drag my body from this throne. Cause the only way I'm getting off it. Yeah. And like, it takes, I don't know whether it's a bit of naivety or if it's fucking pure balls. Like to say, I need, I demand that you open up chance of the Federation so I can lodge a complaint against you. Yeah. Like, so as I said, I don't know whether it's a bit of naivety, like, or, you know, stupidity, or or, just, or is it actually just sheer fucking courage and balls? You know, well, it's not like really like from what they are planning, they don't need her. No, Do you know, they can rule the planet by force. They don't need her. Mm-hmm. Um, and in many ways, <laughs> like it's very much this thing of I don't know why I'm referring to this. Padme in the Phantom Menace. So you're saying that's a little bit that Alpha was a bit like Jar Jar in Revenge of the Sith, right? Yeah. Um, Thalira is a lot like Padme in The Phantom Menace, where her being there and being still in power does mm. help sort of cement what Azix here and legitimize what he's doing. But she's not necessary. No. Do you know? 
And mm. if she dies, whoopsie. Yeah. And so it does take a lot of balls for her to do what she was doing. And at the end, obviously, she bites Eckersley and frees herself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what I would have loved to have seen, though, is... I actually would love to have seen Thalira interact with Agador. Yeah. Or at least comfort him as he like you know was passing or something like that. Yeah. Because she clearly um, looks... She's completely grief-stricken that he died. Yeah, of course. But like. we never had any... I think it would have been nice if we had scenes of them... Because like, Agador clearly fucks off after her to find her. Yeah. Um, and you sort of describe it a bit like a bloodhound. But I sort of... I always had this idea that like... Agador is the protectorate of the throne. Hmm. Do you know? And so I sort of had this idea of like, you know... King Peladon would have taken Thalira to see him as a child. That that's the, I I get the impression like that because he is he is the royal beast and he's the last of his kind like he probably did have like you know a luxury pad <laughs> like where like they they would have kept him you know yeah so I, I would have liked to have seen like um like say like when uh when the doctor and Sarah sort of um qu- you know calm Agador mm-hmm. I almost would have liked to have seen Thalira going down like to an alternative entrance to the pit. Mm-hmm. And just walking in up to Agador with no problems, yeah. And the doctor being like, "Oh, you know, be careful now because you know, you know, he he he's under control, but like whatever." Yeah. And she's just like, <laughs> "Agador has no issue with me, yeah." And just you know, thanking him for his service and you know, sending him back along his merry way. <laughs> um, I, I just think it would have made given a bit more payoff to him being because I don't like the idea of him just being used as a bloodhound. He sort of gets yeah. the sense that, like, they gave him, like, one of her cloaks to sniff her out. Yeah. But I kind of like the idea that they have this connection that he could find her anywhere. Hmm. Because yeah, no. he's her ultimate protector, do you know? Yeah, I I get that. Yeah, I, I can see that. That'd be, that would have been nice. Hmm. I think the only other kind of points I have is, yeah, no, I agree that she's very similar to her father. But I think she has the advantage of him in the sense of he had to learn to become king very quickly mm. because his father died. Whereas I get the impression that she was probably groomed from very early on how to be like, I don't think there's a Regency thing here. I think that she became de facto queen after her father died. Well, she said that her father died when she was very young. Did she? She did. Yeah. Her father died oh. when she was a little girl. Okay, so there was regency. So, so there was right, a regency maybe. thing in place, which again, which oh, could be why Ortron took on so much responsibility. Hmm. Um, you know, and again, not in a bad way, but in a sort of until she is old enough, and he just never acknowledged that she was old enough. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I think I think Talir is a very interesting character. I love that you also like we see at the end she does still have a little bit of growing to do. Yes. Uh, which I think is good because like, that's still her culture and she still needs to get over that. Do you know? Like, I think that this crisis, like, is, it's almost like a forged and fire type thing. Hmm. We get the impression of what type of ruler she's going to be. And, like, with Gebic's support, I think there's going to be huge changes to Peladonian laws and customs. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And the last prominent character we have is Etis. Etis, the hot headed idiot. Yep. Like, his intentions start out good. Mm-hmm. But by the end, he's as mad as a bag of cats. Oh, hugely. Hugely. Like, his paranoia is... Like, the guy that plays him did such a fucking good job at showing his, like, descent into madness. Mm. Like, he's wide-eyed stares when like, he refuses to accept that Gebek hasn't betrayed them. Or fighting the doctor. He goes like, you know, you're right, Doctor. You know, and you know, there is nothing that we can do because uh, you know he just fucking headbutts him and uh, he just tees off on him. Um, he reminds me of Weber from Planet of the Daleks. You know, like the hothead mm-hmm. who thinks he knows better than the leader. Yeah, but yeah, unlike you know, like Etis is. I think Etis is a much rounded character, better character arc to follow. You know. Yeah, like, Etis is clearly um, traditional in his own way. Do you mm. know? He very much believes in the judgment of Agador. Yeah. And he does buy into the mysticism mm-hmm. of what's being presented. Um, He's also, like, he's not 
I say he's a hothead idiot. He's not completely dumb either. Oh no, he's not. But he's a hothead. Yeah, like he knows that if we get their weapons, we will have the power. He's just so clueless to the effects his actions are having. Hmm. And that everything he's doing is actually making things worse. Like every single thing he did yeah. made things worse. <laughs> like hmm. Everything. <laughs> the only benefit anything he did had was when he you know, trapped the doctor in the cave, the doctor got to see what the monster of Peladon actually was doing. Mm-hmm. That's about it, really. Yeah. Um, I think Etis is one of those characters who, sadly, in a story like this, was always destined to die. Like, there was never a version of the story where Etis lived, I don't think. <laughs> no, it was just by whose hand that yeah. he would die. And the fact that it's in a roundabout way by his own is quite fitting. Yeah. No, I, I think it, I think it's a very interesting character arc to to follow. You know. Mm. Very much so. Very much so. And now the villains. Yes, we have Eckersley and Azaxir. So, who would you consider to be the 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 chief villain of the piece? I think the chief villain is Azaxir. Cool. So we'll do Eckersley next. Eckersley, however, is an asshole <laughs> of the highest order. Because mm. even when he, when we think he's on the side of good, he is still an asshole. Yeah, he's very cocky. He has this cocky demeanor. He's cocky. He's condescending. Mm. He is very much the whole into the whole idea of this is a planet of primitives. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of his like you know locking up the weapons and stuff like that is warranted, but like. What he's basically done to this planet is actually, like, quite scary. And the fact that, like, Alpha accepts it, like, Mm. he has cameras positioned all over the, like, the grounds under the Citadel. He Mm. has built all of these things, some of which he doesn't even need yet. Yeah. So he has this communications hub in the Citadel where he can control the entire... He can cut off their air supply. Hmm. And it's like... There wasn't a lot of oversight on him, was there? Because that is supremely fucked up. Well, like with the, the air supply thing, I was... See, he said it's the ventilation system. Hmm. Now, I don't know whether... Because they never really go into it. But is it a case of, like, they need a ventilation system that can be shut down to prevent, like, if a poisonous gas mine go explosion or, you know, poison air comes up from whatever? But they never really say anything to that effect. It's just there's an air system in there, you know? Yeah, an air system that wasn't there before. Yeah, so why would it be shut down? So why did you install one? Now, you could say that because, obviously, the more advanced machinery is going to kick up more dust, it's going to hmm. you know, generate more heat, it's going to require better circulation and whatever. But, like, the fact that he was able to get away with building so much and having so much control that no one else on the planet understands. Even Alpha doesn't understand it. Hmm. Uh, now, I'm sure the um, fawn fellow who died in the first episode, he probably oh. did understand it. Um. <laughs> Nexus, Nexus or whatever his name is. Yeah. Um, but, like, yeah. Eckersley never comes across as a good guy. Not to me, anyway. I He comes across as a good guy, I think, at, towards the start of the episode. But then he, when he's like, well, I was knocked un- unconscious, so I really can't tell. And it's like, oh, man, you're, you're acting kind of fucking shady now for no apparent reason. And it's, 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 it's the way he says it as well. It's like, why would you say something that innocent so evilly? Yeah. You know? I'm going to get into this in the overall, and it kind of feeds into Azix here as well. I don't really understand his plan. His plan was stupid. Um, the plan in I'll, general or the his plan in, ge- plan? The plan in general. The plan in general was stupid. Like, the idea behind the plan is good. Mm-hmm. The implementation was stupid. I'll explain more of that in my overall, but... yeah. I think the only way that the plan would have really worked was that if they had, rather than trying to like you know sell off the Trisilicate to Galaxy Five, paved the way for Galaxy Five to take Peladon. 
you know? Yeah, I mean, much more like that. Um, I was watching uh, Star Wars clips online the other day. Um, and I was watching the clips from the episode of Rebels that Leia is in. Yeah. And the fact that, uh, oh no, her ships just happened to get stolen a lot. <laughs> like, that would have been a better plan, do you know? <laughs> yeah. They were fine, the Tricelicate, but like, he sets up ways for the shipments to be intercepted. Mm. Do you know? Would probably have been a better way to do what it is he was trying to do. Yeah. But yeah, asshole. Uh, I, I think he's one of the most despicable villains in the show's history because he's the one that killed Agador. He is. He is the one that killed Agador. Yeah. And was crying out for the Doctor to help him as he did it. He should be cursed forever in the annals of Doctor Who villain history. <laughs> he's the real monster of Peladon. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's like the hidden message behind I am legend, isn't it? <laughs> And so finally we have Azexir. And I really, really wish that Islir and Sorg were there so they could have kicked the shit out of you and Skell. Yeah, Azexir is a sneaky, cold-hearted bastard who mm. ruined his own plan by letting his evil show too much. Yeah, that's it. He's just, he's so bloodthirsty that his temper just it really shows it doesn't take much to set him off, does it? Like his thing of, okay, you want these things and you want this thing and you want that thing. So what's going to happen is you're going to mine, you're going to oversee it. I'm going to sit back and watch. Mm -hmm. And if anything goes wrong, I'm stepping in. He shouldn't have said, you're going to mine, you're going to oversee it. And if any of you stop working, I'm going to shoot you in the head. <laughs> yeah. I said, like, that was pushing it a little bit too far. A little bit. <laughs> Just, you showed your hand hmm. a little bit too much because the key person that he needed to be on board with what he was saying was Alpha Centauri. Yeah. Who clearly was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> I'm going to kill you, your family, your family's friends, your family's friends' bridge partners, and all your pets, and all your dogs, and all your cats. Yeah, and you have Alpha going, uh, I've been in the Federation for a very long time. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> uh, whereas, had he... like The key to what they were doing being successful... Hmm. Once they landed on, once Azixir appeared on the planet, is to get Alpha on their side. Yeah. Because if they could get Alpha to acknowledge that what they were doing was for the benefit of Peladon and the benefit of everybody, then it would have been fine. But hmm. him walking in saying, My primary purpose is to get the Tricelicate flowing. I don't care how the hell it happens. Put Alpha off. <laughs> <laughs> And this whole, we're going to kill a hostage every hour in a sort of, like, Air Force One type, yeah. thing, type thing. Um, <laughs> the, the, it's just like, dude, you shot yourself in the face. <laughs> what the hell? He's a very good negotiator. He bought you another 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, he ruins his own plan. And you can imagine Echo's in the background going, what the? Idiot. <sighs> Idiot. <laughs> Actually, I think Eckersley was incredibly naive because if his agreement with the Ice Warriors was to, right, ye go back to your war conquering days and I get control of Earth. It's like, who the fuck do you think they're going to conquer first, you dipshit? <laughs> <laughs> but also, like, you know, the Ice Warriors will go back to their, like, war, like, conquering days. You know, not only who will the Ice Warriors conquer first, hey guys... You're selling Tricilicate to Galaxy 5. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're both fucked. Yeah, who are in a war with the Federation, which includes year two planets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which are quite close to each other. So unless Galaxy 5 just leaves the Sol system alone and <laughs> you both get to sort of play house on Earth and Mars, which I don't think is really going to happen, your plan mm. was stupid. Yeah, I just have this image now of the gift from South Park, Mr. Garrison ringing the triangle and saying you the, the certain word alert. <laughs> uh. So, we have reached the overall section where we will give the story a score out of five. So, Trish, would, I think, did you go first last week? Or did I go first last I can't week? Remember. 
Why don't you go first? Okay, fair enough. So I think there must be something in the air on Peladon <laughs> because like this was a great story. Like mm. I I really enjoyed the story. Like lots of intrigue, uh strong performances from both John and Liz, but like we had a really strong, solid supporting cast. Like mm. even like you know, the fucking asshole villains, like Alan Bennion did a great job as the the guy playing uh fucking Eckersley. Mm. But like um one thing that kind of, and this was the point that I had. Alan Bennion was as It was yeah, Donald Gee was Exeter. Donald Gee, thank you very much. Um, what, the point that I had said I'm going to stick a pin in for the overall was that you made the comment that Gebbick reminded you of Colonel Lethbridge Stewart. Mm-hmm. A character that we had previously said reminded us of Colonel Lethbridge Stewart was Islier. Mm. I think it would have been cool if Islier was also in this story. And if imagine, like, you know, if it was a. Azexir was Isler's second in command. Mm. And he, but like in the sense, you know, Isler is still a good guy, but Azexir and the rest of the uh, Ice Warriors are the villains. Yeah. And you had Gebek and Isler working together. That would have been cool. Like, that, that's, the, I think, the one thing that I would love to have seen in this story. While it was great having Alpha Centauri there, by all means, keep Alpha Centauri, but, has, but have Isler come in as well. I think that would have been that would have been really really cool, um, and I'm really sad that like I, I suppose like I was sad to see that the Ice Warriors as a whole were were the villains. Yeah, it's because like we got to see them as the heroes in the previous story after mm. see after two preceding things where they were villains, they were the heroes, the heroes, and now they've just this sect has just gone back to being villains again. So there's no. We talked before about um, the appearances of monocultures mm. within science fiction. It feels like they've just gone back to being that monoculture, even though it's stressed that they're, these guys are just a, a splinter group within Ice Warrior Society. We don't have anyone else within that group to pair it up, kind of like we did last week with the Excellence. Yeah, and I don't remember Cold War. I don't know if I watched it. I don't want to spoil anything for it if I, because I, I don't remember. Cold War is it, it's scenario based as opposed to behavioral based. Okay. Um, like from my, from because my I, w- I, would, I would not like if in Cold War they only paid attention to the first two to Ice Warrior stories one. and this one and they mm-hmm. skipped Curse. Yeah. Um, that, would, that would actually bother me. Um, but we'll mm-hmm. see in what's it say 100 and 60, Sixty stories, yeah. so a couple of years. Yeah, um, yeah I'm just annoyed at that because I, I, I really enjoy the Ice Warriors. They're like one of my favorite classic villains. Um, so, with everything together, performances, story, everything, I'm going to give this a five out of five. Not very really, good. I really enjoy this. Now, I still think Curse is the better of the two Peladon stories. Hmm. Um. I think there's a lot more intrigue in who done it, and I I kind of like that in in the Doctor Who stories. Mm. But here, it, it it felt almost like a Star Trek story at some point, you know, certain points. Like you, you know me, I've said it multiple times. When it comes to science fiction, and we you've got the thing is like you know, uh, galaxy defining spanning empires or federations, like the intrigues involving those and like traitors and interfactional feuding. I love it. And seeing that here was actually really, really cool. I thought it was a really, really good story. So yeah, I'm going to give this a 5 out of 5. Very good. Very good. How so, would you? For me, I like this story way more than I thought I would on a rewatch. Um, it has been a long time since I watched this. I'm the same. It's been a long time and I, I didn't realize that. I didn't think that I would give this a 5 out of 5. It's been a long time since I watched it. Um, you know, not only because I haven't been watching stories since we started the pod i've been watching them in order um for the most part um yeah. but also <laughs> it's just been a long time since i watched paladin in general something i realized is that i rewatch a lot of tom baker sarah jane stories i don't rewatch as many john pertwee sarah jane stories mm-hmm. um so it's been a long time since i've seen this i'd say it's been about five years roughly mm. and after loving curse which i didn't remember loving 10 years ago when i first watched it i was like oh yeah. no have I been remembering them wrong? Yeah. And do I not like Monster of Peladon? Shit. 
Um, but actually, I really liked it. I, I really enjoyed it. I found it really fun to watch. There were a few things I didn't like, though. Um, okay. It did have some very slow moments. But I think most six-parters do. I just think I'm not the biggest fan of six-parters, to be honest. <laughs> um, I usually find that they drag at certain moments, and I would wish they would just pick the fuck up. Yeah, I think we said like one of the few exceptions was probably Planet of the Daleks, where that didn't seem to have an ounce of fat on it. Yeah. Uh, no, for me, I didn't think that there was any slow moments here. But again, six parters can come with that. Yeah, and maybe it's just because I watched them all in one sitting. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> um, which is a lot. It's like three hours, uh, or the the bones of. They're about two. I had three major issues with it, really. Right. right. One is a sort of a major issue in my heart, and two are actually major issues just in general. Okay. Uh, the major issue in my heart is the killed Agador. <laughs> <laughs> you bastards. What the hell? He did nothing. To... I sort of felt like, at, you know, the end, you know, like when Luke kills the Rancor in Return yeah. of the Jedi, and you have the Rancor Tamer bawling his eyes out. <laughs> I sort of felt a bit like that. I was like, what the hell did you have to do that for? <laughs> Oh, I want to make so many t-shirts based off this last two minutes of dialogue from you. <laughs> was like, they killed Agador, you bastards! <laughs> or, or just like Photoshop the Rancor Keeper into the final scene. Yeah, like, why? 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 But no, it was unnecessary. It was unnecessary. Um, but that's more sort of something I didn't like in terms of my heart didn't like it. Um, in terms of things I didn't like about the way the show was done, though, mm-hmm. the plan... The plan was so convoluted, more so than it needed to be, and was destined to fail. Hmm. So the plan was, Eckersley built this thing where he could basically destabilize the planet politically Mm -hmm. by riling up the miners, getting them to not mine the stuff he needs them to mine, because they're afraid of Agador. Which leads to a possible rebellion between the miners and the leading class. Which leads to Alpha Centauri calling in the Federation. Which mm-hmm. leads to Azixir turning up on the planet and basically taking control and saying, I'm going to bring in outside miners to get this done. So they can mine faster. And sell the Trisilicate to Galaxy 5. That plan makes no fucking sense. Why have why scare the miners to make them not mine? If you need them to mine because you want to sell it. Why like the better thing to do, like we said, would have been to actually help the miners, like get them mm. on your side. And then sell the Trisilicus once it's off the planet. Yeah. Their plan because makes like, no sense. <laughs> like the one thing we're never told, right, is that our Galaxy 5 on board with Eckersley taking over Earth and the Ice Warriors just rampaging as a conquering faction. Because I doubt it. If you're hold- <laughs> Yeah, so like like or is it a case of like, yeah, yeah, you can rampage, but you can only go within like the Sol system or you can only go as far as a certain point in time it's like going cool so you mean like it's also kind of stupid from galaxy 5's part of like if that's the case because like okay your agreement is to allow the what we're to assume one of the chief military wings of the federation to secede so they can set up their own empire which he may come in conflict with in the future well see i think from galaxy 5's perspective i think galaxy 5 are playing this right they just want fucking Trisilicus. Yeah. They don't give a yeah. shit. Yeah, I oh, know. Like, so, like, my question then is posed from the point of view of going, right, okay, you're, you're, you're thinking about setting up like this big fucking seceding from the Federation, you're going to set up this empire. Do you really think that Galaxy 5 are going to fucking tolerate that? Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think the plan is stupid. Um, which, unfortunately, kind of derails my enjoyment of it a little bit. Um, mm. the other thing, and this is again, it's a small thing, is if you're someone who's watched the show, say you just watched John Pertwee's run, yeah, the title, The Monster of Peladon, 
and trying to sell that it's the spirit of Agador, we as an audience know that's bollocks. Yep. Before we ever watch the episode. Because mm. we know that Agador isn't a monster. Because we saw him X number of stories ago. Um, I think Return to Peladon would actually have been a perfect title because it doesn't give anything away. And you still get all the shocks of, oh my god, the Ice Warriors are bad now, and blah, 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 blah. blah. And I think it would have been a better development. Yeah. That's what I didn't like. And the main thing I didn't like was the plan. The title is just a bit annoying, and they killed Agador, <laughs> which... Boo on you. <laughs> what I did like about it, though, very strong mm-hmm. showing from the Doctor and Sarah, a great development of their relationship, at least from her side, if not necessarily from his. Um mm. Very good supporting cast, particularly Gebek, Alpha Centauri, and Azaxir. I was very impressed by. Mm. The others were good as mm. well, but those three in particular um, impressed me. I think it's interesting to return to a planet like Peladon because it's almost... <laughs> this is almost like the pre, the massive precursor to Star Trek Lower Decks. Mm. What happens after first contact what happens yeah. after someone joins the federation and that's really yeah. interesting to look at do you know clearly the people of peladon still cling to their beliefs and they're still treated as primitives and it's so unfortunate to see that what king peladon wanted for his planet isn't happening they're just being used for their resources yeah because like I, i'm trying to think i think the only thing we've ever seen something like this was like in the in the arc Hmm. Whereas, like, in the same story, they go to the same place in two different points in time. Yeah. Whereas here, I think it's nice to actually, after a period of time, and even coming back with a different companion, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. No, I thought that was really, really good. Um, I love the Venusian lullaby. I will love it forever. Mm-hmm. Um, And I think overall, the story was really, really good. So there was a couple of bits where I think it sort of slowed down a bit. There's a lot of running in tunnels. Hmm. back and forth and back and forth and whatever um but i I just think i'm not a big fan of six parters i think i think i get bored (laughs) partway through which isn't just like i think i I, I think that's just me i i think there are very few six parters that i'm willing to that i that i've given a five to i it's got to be something that really fucking hooks you in however on the other hand though like good characters good story overall um, mm-hmm. good development of our side characters, which is great. We get to see Thalira develop. We get to see Alpha develop. We get to see Gebek sort of come into his own. We get to see mm. Ortron sort of learn the error of his ways. A lot of really good character development. So for me, I gave it a 4.75. The only thing that kept mm. it really from being a 5, like the pacing mm-hmm. thing of a 6 character, I can let go because that's just my personal bugbear. Um, it's just the plan was stupid and it sort of made me go this was your plan and Azixir is just going to walk in and not even pretend to be civil um, like he showed his evil way too early and for the rest yeah. of it it was kind of like okay your plan was stupid and you're an idiot yeah which because like you know I, I remember I I had to listen back. Uh, one, that's one of the reasons why I listened back to Curse was to see if I had uh, given a spoiler. Between the two Peladon stories, I couldn't remember in which one the Ice Warriors were the bad guys. Neither could I. Neither could I when we yeah. watched the Curse. I couldn't remember either. Yeah. Also, for some reason, I th- I thought that there was another human involved in this, as, op- like, I, as opposed to just Eckersley. I thought that there was another fucking human knocking around the place. I think I might have got that confused with... Um, the mutants with the fucking guy running around the place, you know, the bald yeah. guy, Lobot. It may also have been the fawn at the beginning. Um, uh, no, I didn't even Nexus. remember the fawn. <laughs> well, that's the other thing, right? In terms of the plan, Nexus mm. clearly understood everything they were doing. He comes from a mining background, and clearly he wasn't yeah. in on the plan. Mm. So he should have been raising hell long before they decided to kill him off like there should have mm. been tension between him and Eckersley at at minimum and there wasn't 
So it's like you're telling me the guy who comes from a mining background um, didn't look in the refinery and see all this weird tech to create an artificial agador that was going to burn people alive. He didn't. Nope. He didn't. He just didn't notice. Really, like I get why they killed him off. Yeah, but like, we don't know if he knew anything, and if he didn't know anything, that's kind of dumb. We just need. We just needed a cool-looking alien to die. <laughs> yeah, oh, he was a cool design though. He was wasted in like what fifteen minutes. <laughs> but, like, Not cool, even like, cool, <laughs> cool, cool, cool design. <laughs> I was just I was just taking a look back there, and I think the only six parters that we've given a five to were Enemy of the World and Planet of the Daleks. We've given fives mm-hmm. to seven parters and a ten parter, but six parters usually are like, eh. <laughs> oh, I don't know what it is about a six parter. There's a moment in a six parter where I'm like, cool, we're at the end of part five, and I'm like, no, that was the end of part four. I'm like, god damn it. Um, <laughs> but again, that's probably because I watch it in one go. <laughs> Did you know? Um, and eventually time just rolls rolls all together but Joe this was our penultimate story of season 11 season mm-hmm. 11 is currently sitting at 4.13 for you and 3.94 for me Death of the Daleks really nuked how this sto- how this season was going it, re- it really really did because the other three were 5, 4 and now 5, 4.75 um, so it'll be interesting to see next week if Planet of the Spiders brings it back up and makes up for that that blip in the middle. Oh, definitely. It'd be very interesting to see that. But not only is it the penultimate episode of the season, it is the penultimate mm-hmm. episode of John Pertwee's time as the Doctor. It is indeed. So how will the how will his final story go? We'll have to see. And as always, next week we will also have a rambling based on John's tenure and we will give our thoughts on his strengths, weaknesses and his best stories and his weakest stories. That, I think, is going to be very interesting. Yeah, I'm going to have to spend some time this weekend thinking that through because yeah, it's been hard for a lot of them. Hmm. I think it'd be really hard for John. I think his weakest stories might be easy to pinpoint. I think his I think his strong ones are gonna be harder. Yeah, I th- like I think like there's one that fucking screams weakest, and then there's one oh Jesus, there's two that fucking scream best. Ah uh, Christ, yeah. this is gonna be like Joe, isn't it? Yeah, so I I've just realized thought- I was thinking about like oh his stories. I was like, oh wait, he has all his stories with Liz Shaw. They're also on the table. Yeah, <laughs> an entire season is, is, is up on the fucking block for like best or worst. Uh, yeah. So until until next week, guys. Bye. Bye.